Madam President of the Assembly of State Parties, Mr. Prosecutor, Mr. Registrar, Madam Chair of the Board of Directors, dear Vibes Presidents and fellow judges, honorable ministers, esteemed delegates of states and representatives of civil society. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to take the floor before you today. We are at the end of an exceptional year for the International Criminal Court. The court's workload reached unprecedented heights with new trials as well as new investigations. We celebrated the ICC's 20th anniversary, a mark of significant maturity of our institution. And we returned to full physical presence at the court's premises, ending a long and demanding period of adapted working methods during the pandemic. The demands and expectations toward the ICC may be higher today than ever before. And the court is responding to these expectations with full dedication. Our staff is working with incredible commitment across the organs and actors all level of seniority. The ICC is truly a living court in action. At The Hague, but also elsewhere, much of the work that makes the trials possible happens in the situation countries. And conversely, that is also where the impact of the trials and judgments is most felt. To fully appreciate the court's activities as well as impact on the ground, I traveled two weeks ago to Bangui, to the Central African Republic. This is something I had intended to do since the very first day I assumed the position of the ICC president. I was keen to meet with staff of the ICC working in the court's country office in challenging circumstances. I wanted to meet with community leaders and hear the perceptions of the ICC. And I wanted to meet with victims benefiting from projects of the Trust Fund for Victims. The visit to Bangui was rewarding and true provoking in these and several other aspects. I had the chance to hear the personal stories of many victim survivors from the 2002-2003 conflict who are now benefiting from assistance projects of the Trust Fund ongoing in several parts of the country. I do not have sufficient words to describe the courage and dignity of these survivors, most of them women. The suffering and the adversity they have faced is truly difficult to comprehend. It was very rewarding to hear how the health services, psychological rehabilitation and income generating activities that make part on ongoing trust projects have helped them rebuild their lives. This is not only thanks to the Trust Fund for Victims and all those who have made generous donation to it. The transformative effect of the Trust Fund projects is also in great amount thanks to the fantastic local partners organization carrying out the work on the ground. I was truly impressed by the expertise and professionalism and how much positive impact they are managing to do with limited resources. These encounters reinforce my already strong conviction that justice must have a restorative element. And I am proud to work for a court 
whose founders had the wisdom to make reparation a key part of its concept of justice, moving away from the idea that retribution on its own is sufficient. Madam President, I also met in Bangui with a number of community leaders who worked together with the ICC outreach to raise awareness about the ICC and the local communities. Let me quote what one of them said. Before the access to justice program, we did not know each other. Today we are the team, we are a family, and we work with the ICC to help disseminate messages in our communities and how international criminal justice works. We do this as volunteers because we want people to understand the importance of justice which is needed in Central Africa." End of quote. Needless to say, this was inspiration to hear. At the same time, the long conversation I had with them was also sobering. They told me about a huge lack of information, and they posed many difficult questions, such as why is person X prosecuted, but not person I? What about accomplices? What about the big fish? Why is justice so slow, and so on? I, I told them honestly that I do not have all the answers, but. but it, it was clear that this is a strong need for justice. And that takes me another theme uh, which uh, also featured strongly during my stay in Central Africa. It's complementarity. The ICC is, has invested a great amount of efforts into providing justice in Central Africa. And I was glad to see that this has inspired efforts to deliver justice in the national jurisdiction. I am encouraged by the increasing activity of the Special Court in Bangui, which issued the first judgment a couple of months ago. I met with the court's principals and several judges, and we had a long discussion on how to increase mutual cooperation between the two courts. The Special Court is a prime example of complementarity at work, and we must to our best to support it. In any given situation, the ICC will only ever be able to hear a limited number of cases to make significant progress toward closing the gap of impunity. National jurisdictions have to step in, sometimes with international, sometimes with international support. We must all work together towards the same goals of accountability and justice with the fullest respect for the rule of law and the fairness of proceedings. Support for national proceedings does not undermine our court in any way. The role of the ICC as a permanent beacon of justice, spurring national authorities to action is indispensable. Madam President, the full cooperation of states is crucial for the conduct of the court's mandate and the discussion I had in the Central African Republic under, under, underlined it. I was also able to witness the critical role played by the staff in the court's country offices. These staff, national as well as international, are a vital link between the ICC's headquarters and all those invested in the court's proceedings in the situation country, whether as victims, witnesses, witnesses national authorities, or as members of the affected communities, civil society, and the society at large. I also wish to take a moment to recognize the vital work carried out by the teams for the defense and the legal representatives of victims, including on the ground in situation countries. Madam President, as I mentioned, the court is coping with a record high workload in terms of trials as well as investigations, and there is a more in the pipeline. Some of it is predictable, some is unpredictable. What is certain, however, is that when you inject more fuel to the engine, it creates more output. 
In the case of the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor is an engine. The increased activity of the OTP is bound to generate more work for the chambers of some point. It is critically important to build capacity now so that we can cope effectively with the workload that awaits us next year. We need a sufficient and balanced regular budget for, the, for this purpose. In particular, we must have the capacity to support simultaneous trials in three courtrooms of the court through the entire year 2023. This is an avoidable cost increase compared to these simultaneous trials for only three months in 2022. But I stress that anything else would lead to slowing down the trials, generating costly delay and, and undermining the right to a fair and expeditious trial. And it could lead to more delays down the line for other cases. For all these reasons, I call for your support for a sufficient budget for the court. Madam President, continuous improvement is another key part of the being prepared for the future. Through the past year, we have worked closely with the review mechanism to finalize the assessment of recommendations, while at the same time implementing many of them. One of the most tangible areas where we have made positive changes as a result of the IR is workplace culture. The recruitment of the ombudsperson and of a permanent focal point for gender equality is in the final stage. We have updated all key policies and anti harassment bullying and disciplinary procedures. The judges have amended the code of conduct to clarify that these policies apply to them as well. They have also decided to establish an informal complaints mechanism for the judiciary to address alleged abuse of authority. In the judiciary, the independent oversight mechanism conducted a detailed evaluation of the staff working conditions following my request. This has given us numerous important pointers for improvement, and we are taking measures in response. These are just a few examples of the numerous positive changes that are happening in the court. We are going in a good direction, and we will continue to do so. Madam President, I cannot finish without mentioning the universality of the Rome Statute. This is one of my highest priorities. It is challenging and often unrewarding work, as there are no real low-hanging fruit left. I have truly tried to use every opportunity I had uh, which I could create to urge more states to join the ICC. And I remain an optimist that sooner or later, some of our joint efforts will bear fruit. And we will see the number of state parties grow, hopefully already next year. Many non-state parties are present in this room today. I call upon you all to take steps toward joining the Rome Statute without delay. Madam President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I could easily speak for another hour, but, but I believe my time is, is up. However, I, I look forward uh, to uh, future en uh, engaging with, with you on, on, on topical issues at the many meetings and side events during this week. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your support for the court. I wish you, everyone, a productive session.